Amen. You can have a seat. It is so good to be with you guys tonight. It has been almost a month since I've gotten to preach, and uh, I'm not even supposed to be here, but I did not want to wait any longer uh, to preach, and thank you guys so much for your prayers for my family and our new addition to our family, Little Deacon. Um, we really, really covet your prayers, and uh, have actually slept. We've, I have actually slept. So that's, and so has Ashley. Um, and so we're, we're just really blessed um, by the Lord. And, and yeah, I'm super excited to be here. And I think that God's got some uh, good things for us tonight. So as I began thinking about what, what tonight is hopefully going to be like, uh, it made me think of a time when, uh, you know, there's just these different times in life where these things happen to us. And we may have an expectation of it, and, and that expectation can either come true or it doesn't. And so I immediately started thinking of just the expectation uh, that I had for um, uh, my wife giving birth to our son. So with my first son, Braxton, uh, Ashley had an emergency C-section, so we never did the whole uh, laboring and, and a midwife person. To, um, my expectation of that was basically what you see in the movies, like this that this thing just happens in a matter of a few hours and, you know, she goes into labor, her water breaks and you have a baby and it's done. Well, that's not what happened. Ashley labored for like three days, literally three days, um, and then was able to have Deacon late on Monday night a week ago or a week and a half ago. So my expectation of that didn't go the way that I thought it would <laughs> and it didn't go the way that she thought it would either. Uh, but in the end, it was good, right? In the end, it was good. And uh, there's other times when like, we, we may get into a situation and we, we don't know which way it's going to go. We don't know if it's going to go good or bad. And I couldn't help but think of, of, of times whenever like you get called in the office by your boss or, or when you like when you're in school, and you get called in the office immediately when that happens, when you're walking to the office, you start racking your brain of what did I do wrong, right? Whenever, whenever you get called in the office, it rarely is ever I'm getting a raise. Like that's rarely ever the thing that comes to our minds. But sometimes we do get a raise. Like sometimes it's a really good thing. Um, and, and our expectations of it uh, can set us up to view it one way or another. So I say all of that because of the topic that we're going to talk about tonight. Our expectations of that topic can cause us to turn off our brains really quickly. Jesus is going to jump into, and, and I did not plan this at all with the chapel campaign or anything like that. This is just where we are in the Sermon on the Mount, but we're going to talk about money tonight. Uh, so don't let your expectation of that immediately shut you down to say, forget that. I don't want to hear about that because that's, honestly, if, if I'm at a church visiting and they start talking about money, I'm just like, Pfft what is going on? Like, you know, and, and immediately we may begin to start saying, oh, that's all that churches want. That's all that they're, they're about. Let me put you at ease. We're not going to take an offering tonight. And I don't know if you've noticed, we've never taken an offering on a Wednesday night. Uh, so we're not after your money. That's not what this is about. Don't tune me out. Don't set an expectation that you think this is going to go one way, because honestly, I believe the Holy Spirit's going to take it a different way than you probably expect. And so let's allow the Lord to move tonight. Let's not let the idea that Jesus is going to introduce with money shut us off to what I really believe the Holy Spirit wants to do. And in your heart, it may have to do with money. Maybe it does, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe it has to do with something completely different. And if you tune the Lord out now because of it, we're going to miss out. And I don't want us to miss out. So you're not getting called to the office, right? This is going to be a good thing. I think God wants to really do some some amazing things in us. Um, So with that, Let's go ahead and read the chunk of Matthew 6 that we're going to be in for the whole night. So we're going to pick up in verse 19 of Matthew chapter 6. I'll give you guys a little bit of time to get there. It looks like most of everyone is there already. So Matthew 6 verse 19 says this. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, that that word healthy there can also be translated singularly focused. Okay? So, So if the eye is healthy or singularly focused, your body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad... Your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, 
how great is the darkness. And this makes verse 24 make a little bit more sense when you think of singularly focused. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God, and there it is, money. And so Jesus introduces, Jesus talks about money a lot, actually, in the New Testament. It's, it's one of the topics that he talks about almost more than anything else. Uh, he talks about money a ton. And I, I think there's a lot of reasons why he does this, uh, because money is exposing. That's why. And that's why we don't like to hear about it. Uh, but I want to talk, before we jump into this idea of how I think we view money as Americans, uh, let's, let's talk about this idea of a singular focus and, and more of what Jesus is talking about where he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. Um, and so if, if our eyes are focused on the right thing, we're full of light. If our eyes are focused on the wrong thing, we can be full of darkness. And so I need somebody to help me do this. And I was thinking, Jeremy, if you would just come help me real quick, this is going to be great. Did you play sports growing up? Okay. That may not play to my advantage in this, but all right. If you can see Jeremy, I have a tennis ball. Uh, I'm going to throw this to you. Not hard. Catch it if you can. It'd be great. Okay, singular focus. Now throw it back. Okay, so that was pretty easy, right? Let's see if he can do a, a double focus, right? I have two focuses, and, and it's possible. You could catch both of these. So let's see. Okay, great. You crossed him on me. <laughs> so, so it's possible, but it's, not, it's harder, right? It's harder. Okay, trust me. I, I promise you, you can trust me. Close your eyes. Now catch them. Keep, them. keep your eyes closed. You didn't do too well. All right, thanks. That's all I needed. Okay, so this is what that little parable is talking about. When the eye is open and singularly focused, the body follows. The body is full of light. The body responds to what the eye is focused on. When the eye is closed, you see Jeremy, he, his body couldn't react. He couldn't see where to go or what to do because his eyes were not focused on the task at hand or what they should be focused on. His eyes were closed. Therefore, his body responded in darkness. It did nothing because he didn't know what to do. And so Jesus then takes this parable and says, you cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve two things. And Did Jeremy catch both of the balls when I threw them to him? Yes, it was harder, but he caught them. Eventually, one will win out. That's the reality. Eventually, if you're serving two masters, if you're trying to hold on to God and something else, one of them is going to win out in the end. And so the the way that I think that we view money in particular uh, is where I want to focus a little bit of our time, but the main area that I want us to focus on is the treasure of the heart. Where, what's the treasure of our heart tonight in particular? And, and too often, I think we will tune out of a sermon like this way too early because we think we've got it figured out. How many of you think you're greedy? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you think you're greedy? I think our knee-jerk reaction is to think we're not greedy for the most part. Maybe some of you are like, no, I am greedy and I know it. But for the most part, like, I don't, I don't think of myself as a greedy person. Why? Why do I not? Well, there's not a ton of things. There are some things maybe that you could point to in my life that say, well, maybe that, that would say that you're greedy or that you love money more than you should or that you love money, period. But it's a, that's kind of a hard thing to identify, isn't it? How many of you think you're a thief? Well, you either know you're a thief or you're, you're not. Either you steal things or you don't, right? I mean, it's, it's a very, those are easy things to define. If you're, if you're addicted to something, it's probably easy to define. If you're an adulterer, you, you could probably define that pretty easily. But when it comes to money, there's this gray line of like, what defines a love of money and, and, and not? What I think that the Lord does over and over and over in our lives is this kind of cleaning of the gospel lenses. And that's what I'm hoping happens tonight. Um, I love to ride four-wheelers. I love to go hunting. Um, And I've ridden dirt bikes before, uh, pretty unsuccessfully, but I did it. Um, And one of the things that they had that I I thought was pretty cool is you you have a helmet, or you should have a helmet, and you have these goggles. Well, dirt bikes throw dirt up in your face like crazy, especially when you're on a track. These goggles have these stickers that go on them. And you get like five stickers, and they're layered on top of each other. And as you're riding, you get, sure enough, dirt's kicked into your face. And you grab one of the tabs, and you pull it. 
And all of a sudden, you can see very clearly. That's what I'm hoping happens tonight. That as we dive into what the treasure of our heart is, the Holy Spirit grabs the gospel lens that is over our face and removes some of the dirt so that we can begin to see more clearly. The reality of this is, over time, this will need to be done again. Over time, dirt is going to get on our lenses, and we're not going to be able to see as clearly, and we need the Holy Spirit to, in the course of our life, over and over and over and over again, clear the lenses so we can see more clearly where our heart is deceiving us. Because the reality of it is our hearts do deceive us. And we need sermons like this. I know I need sermons like this to reveal where my heart is deceiving. And then it's up to me to respond. So I think that we view money, all that to say, I think we view money in two different ways in particular. We view it as safety or status. So two ways that most of us, we either view money in both of those avenues or one more than the other. For me, it's both. It really is. And, and, and the way that this is telling for me, as I think about um, safety in particular, I sleep a lot better when I have some money in my bank account. I just do. I, I don't worry about money as much. I can sleep easier. I'm not having anxiety. I'm not panicking about it. When there's a little bit of money in my account, I feel safe. And then the opposite of that is true. When, when things are tight and we don't have the money that I would like for us to have, man, I don't sleep good. And I begin to worry and I begin to try to scheme in my head how I can acquire more money so that I can get back to feeling safe again. Or we view it as a status type of thing. And, and this is really easy to explain. How do you view rich people? Do you think them better than you? Do you wish that you were them? Do you wish that you had what they had? Do you think yourself better than them? Or how do you view poor people? How do you view homeless people? How do you feel about yourself when you have a lot of money in your bank account? Is there a swagger that's missing when your account's low? Is there a swagger that's present when your account is high? Is it a status type of thing for you? The reality is both will betray you. Both of them are wrong because they're an illusion. Money doesn't provide safety. Now, money can make things easier in life. I'm not blind to that reality. But money in itself does not provide safety. Like money, money can't stop somebody from breaking into your house. Well, you could say, oh, you could buy things that could stop somebody from breaking into your house. But it's probably the money that's causing somebody to break into your house in the first place. I used to have a really, really junky old truck that I never locked. I, n- I never locked it. The thing had 170,000 miles on it. The paint was fading like crazy, and the door would fly open on me sometimes when I would turn too fast. I was not worried about anyone stealing that truck. Right? It just didn't have a lot of value in it. And so with, with money, money in itself, though, it doesn't, it doesn't provide this safety. It can provide the illusion of safety, but it's not going to keep you alive, right? Like you could, you could be driving down the road tonight and get hit by a car and die and have millions of dollars in your bank account. It doesn't protect you, but we give it this illusion that it does or that it gives us some kind of status over somebody, or that we are more valuable because of what's in our bank account than a homeless person. When in reality, when we look through the gospel lenses that we should be looking through, status has nothing to do with how much money you have, but status has everything to do with who you are in Christ. Right? You're either saved or you're not. Those are the only statuses that we should be worried about, and those are the only statuses that we should view somebody through. Nobody should have more importance to us because they have money or less importance to us because they don't. And so as we begin to think about just the idea of money, how do you view it? What does it, what does it bring to you? Do you view it as a thing that gives you safety? It's as foolish, not, not that my son is foolish for thinking this, but when I go to the lease, I like to bring my son with me and, and we'll go hunting and, and stuff like that. Well, because dad has a gun, he wants to have a gun. And so Braxton has this little BB gun that he's only allowed to shoot out at our lease. And in his mind, that BB gun provides protection. And he'll talk about it with me like, dad, I'm going to kill a hog 
if they come out with this BB gun. I'm like, no, you're going to tick a hog off with that thing. You're not going to kill anything. But in his mind, it provides safety for him, right? That he's going to do something with it. That thing would be better as a baseball bat than, than to, to shoot with. And so it's, it's an illusion that and we view money that way, though. We think it can provide something for us that only God can provide for us. And so when, when you're looking through the lens of the gospel and you see money, what are you asking of it? Do, wh- why, why do you want it? Why do we tend to hold to it? And I, I'm talking about me, like my own heart and the struggles that I have to give to those in need, to give uh, to the church, to give even to the chapel campaign. Like there's a struggle in my heart that I have to deal with of like, why? Why do I want to hold so tightly to this? What do I think that money can provide for me? And then the reality of that is I become a slave to it. Because whatever the treasure of my heart is, I am immediately enslaved to. So to, to show you this, I want to read a, a story in Matthew 19. Um, go ahead and turn in your Bibles there because we're going to read a pretty good chunk of Matthew 19. I am sure almost all of you are familiar with this story. But it gets to the root of the heart of what Jesus is trying to talk about. So Matthew 19, we're going to pick up in verse 16. This is the rich young man, or the rich young ruler, as a lot of people have called it. Verse 16, And behold, a man came up to him, that being Jesus, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? This question is not a weird question, by the way, for him to be asking. Because you have to remember back then, uh, before Jesus dies on the cross, salvation comes through deeds and sacrifices of animals. And so that's why he's asking and thinking this way. Jesus is going to flip this on him, as I'm sure most of you know. Verse 17. And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would, if, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. We'll stop there. So, this, the story is you got this young guy. He's got a lot of stuff. Wants, wants to go to heaven. Wants to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Um, we all know that that's selling our stuff is not what gets us salvation. Right? And so it's like, why would Jesus say that? He's, he's attacking his heart. Jesus doesn't care about his possessions. He cares about that, the fact that that guy cares about his possessions too much. That's what Jesus is trying to get after. And then the guy is sorrowful because he doesn't want to give up his treasure. He doesn't want to give up the treasure of his heart. Your heart will always expose you. And honestly, money exposes you. Because whatever you spend your money on, that's what your heart treasures. Just look at your bank account. You'll see really quickly what you value and what you treasure. And so for the rich young man, he goes away. He doesn't inherit the kingdom of God because he treasures his possessions too much. And then you hear it is uh, hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven as hard as it would be for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Um, A lot of people have used that and tried to explain it in different ways. He's not talking about a needle, like a sewing needle. Um, For a long time, people said that there was a gateway, an entryway into the city of Jerusalem that was called the eye of the needle. Uh, but a better interpretation of that would actually be just the smallest doorway into a home was called the eye of a needle. And so he's saying it would be very difficult for a camel, as large as it is, to go into your home. Uh, That's what Jesus is trying to get at. So not necessarily impossible, but almost very difficult. And then if you read further, he says, but with God, all things are possible. And so that's this, the thing that I want us to focus on tonight is what is the treasure of our heart? If Jesus was to come up to you tonight and say to you, 
to get rid of X, to get rid of whatever it would be if your knee-jerk reaction is to, like Braxton would, if I were to say, Braxton, give me that, and he's got a couple of toys in his hands, and he takes one and he puts it behind his back and he goes like this, this is what I want to deal with tonight. Whatever, if God were to come up to us and say, give me that, your knee-jerk reaction would be to go like this. Give you what? Because we all do that. There are different areas of our hearts that we value and treasure. And so, okay, let me list off a few because I want, if it is money for you, then that's where you need to rest tonight and focus on and allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you on. But if it's not that, then let's get away from that. So I want to list off a couple of different things. Some of you may say, I ain't got no money. That ain't the thing, you know, and that's fine. I'm with you, right? Okay, let's do this. So what is the thing then? Maybe it's family. And I know that sounds weird because it's like, but family is a good thing. Money is a good thing. The love of money is not a good thing. Money can be used in great ways, right? Money can do missions and it can, it can provide for people who are in need. It can do all kinds of wonderful things. It's loving those things too much that becomes difficult, becomes evil, becomes almost damning in some cases with the rich young ruler, right? So is it family? Like when God says, give me that, do you take your family and say, you can have everything else, but you can't have this? Is it your children? Is it a spouse? Is it your husband or your wife? Or maybe the desire for a spouse. Maybe that's the thing. You want to be married so bad that you're willing to do whatever you have to do to get that thing. And that's the thing that God wants you to give to him. And you keep putting it behind your back and saying, what are you talking about? And you're trying to do this thing where you're holding on to God and you're holding on to something else and you're serving two masters. And there's this push-pull that's happening in your life. Maybe it's work. And again, there's a reason why, right? And, and you need to dig into that reason why. So if it is work, why is it work? What does work provide for you? What security do you find in it or identity do you find in it? What thing are you looking for that you should be looking for in God because that needs to be identified as well. The underlying issue of why that thing is the treasure of your heart needs to be discovered and that can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit because if you're, let, let's say you are greedy tonight, get back to the, where we kind of started. How do you identify that? How do you figure that out, right? There's not really a great line that I can give for you to say, if you're on this side of the line, you're greedy or if you're on this side, you're not. For, all, for every person, that can look way different, right? And so for work, in particular, this thing that we're talking about now, I don't know how to create that line for you. Honestly, I don't think I can. I think the Holy Spirit has to do that. So it's, it's whatever you are treasuring and valuing more than Christ. Maybe it's friends. Maybe you're so desperate to have friendships that you crush the friendships you have. Because you put a God-like weight and demand on your friendships. Your friends can't carry that load. God is the only one that can be God of your life. Your friends can't be that. Can't carry that load for you. Or maybe it is status. It's having the right things, driving the right car, having the right spouse, having the right house, having your kids obey the right way. Just being able to have status. Maybe that's the treasure of your heart. We don't get to serve two masters. I, I want to reread for you the end of verse 24, or, or verse 24 of Matthew chapter 6. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. You don't get to have this thing on the side and ha hold on to God. God's not going to accept it. He's a jealous God of your affections and your desires. And that's not a bad thing. Like when we hear that God is a jealous God, sometimes we want to pull back from that. We should run to that. Because whatever else God could be jealous for as far as your affections and the treasure of your heart is, that thing is enslaving you. Jesus is trying to free you. Right? He's, we, Paul explains this, Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ 
has set us free. Stand firm slave to that thing. It's going to own your affection. It's going to own your time. It's going to own your money. It's going to own your life. Jesus comes to destroy that so you can let go of that. And he's the only one that can provide for you what your heart actually desires. So he's not trying to take something from you. We've talked about this a ton. He's trying to give something to you. So open your hands. This is the approach that I want us to have with the Lord tonight. Open our hands. If it's our money, I want us to open our our hands. If it's our kids, open our hands. What illusion are we living under thinking that our life will be be better with this thing? We're going to be like the rich young ruler. We're going to walk away with disappointment at some point. He got to realize it right there. The problem is he didn't respond. Right? He didn't turn back around and run to the Lord. You have that opportunity tonight. Don't be like the rich young ruler. Don't walk away in disappointing, disappointment saying, oh, I wish I didn't value that thing so much. Jesus is saying that I came to set you free from that thing. I get, I, I, I get frustrated with my own self when this happens. When the Holy Spirit begins to reveal something, I want to tuck it behind my back. I want to say, no, 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 I want to hold on to that. I like that. And then I realize, oh my gosh, life is so much easier without that stinking thing. Like, it's so much freer when I'm not worried about money and actually trust the Lord. I don't have anxiety attacks and panic attacks, but we're going to talk about that next week. So the Holy Spirit will begin talking to us and, and prodding on our hearts and revealing things to us. And then we'll respond like this, James 1, 22 through 25. But be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgetting what it was like. So it's like looking into a mirror, seeing that there's like crusties on your face from sleeping, and then saying, I think that'll fly. And then just going to work. It's like we would never do that, right? We care too much about what, what our appearance, right? We clean that off. We would do something with it. And, and what the Holy Spirit's doing is he's taking the Bible and he's saying, look at this. What's the treasure of your heart? And you're looking at it and you're saying, it's my family. Like I care more about my family than I do about you, Lord. And then we go, you know what? It'll fly. It's okay. And we, and we walk away thinking that it's going to be all right. Or maybe it is money. We look at this and we say, I value money too much. And I don't trust the Lord enough, which in turn means I don't give to those who are in need. I keep more than I should and I'm not generous. And we see that and we hear that and we go, you know what? It's all right. I'll just let it fly. Don't do that tonight. Verse 25, James 1, verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the Bible, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. We have the opportunity to walk in the blessings and the freedom of the Holy Spirit's work and power as he reveals things through the word. And we have the opportunity to walk in that tonight. And so I want to ask you, what's the treasure of your heart tonight? And the treasure of your heart tonight is, is really what I'm after. Not, maybe not historically. Like, don't look back on some thing that it's like, oh, that used to be a struggle, but it's not really anymore. What's going on in your heart tonight? Because your heart will deceive you. There are things that need to be worked out. I fully believe it. If you will take some time, allow the Holy Spirit to begin to work, there's something that the Holy Spirit will reveal that there's a treasure in your heart that's maybe not the Lord, and he wants to free you of that tonight. And then the last question, what needs to happen in your life to make God the treasure of your heart? So as he reveals something, whatever it may be, what action needs to take place, be a doer. Don't allow the Holy Spirit to reveal something to you, and then you go, you know what? I think it'll fly. I think I'll be all right. You would never do that with your own natural face. Don't do that with your spiritual, your, your relationship with God. I mean, it's, this is, we're talking about eternal things here that, that the Lord wants to do in our lives tonight. So let's, let's do that, right? Let's be unwilling to move out of this space without having met with the Lord. And if you're not hearing anything, man, ask somebody to pray for you. Don't be afraid of that. 
I feel like we've been at this long enough that we can ask one another to pray and encourage each other. Even if it's, I don't know what it is, but I want the Holy Spirit to show it to me. Or I do know what it is, and I've failed at this over and over and over again, and I don't want that to be the case anymore. So let's, let's deal with the Lord tonight, as I believe he will be faithful to deal with us if we'll just simply allow it. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to respond. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the gospel. And that as you reveal things to us, we don't have to look into a mirror and see sin in our lives and then not have any ability to see something change. But we get to look into your word tonight, see these things that need to change, see maybe the the tendings of our hearts towards things other than you, and we have the opportunity to change because of the gospel. So Holy Spirit, I I ask that you would be faithful to move tonight. You'd be faithful to reveal that literally everybody in this room tonight would be able to walk away having heard from you, being encouraged by you, being freed through the power of the cross and the Holy Spirit moving in that power. I pray all of us would experience that tonight. Not for our own glory, God, but for yours. So be faithful to move, Lord. I pray that we would be patient to wait. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name and for your glory.